there's something out there waiting for us. And it ain't no man. Don't you even know how to be a real Indian? Well, sometimes they have to kill us. They have to kill us. Because they can't break our spirit. Hey everybody, it's Ian, back again for another episode of Native Film Talk. Today we're talking about Dark Winds, the show on AMC+. And today I'm joined by Marley Lister, friend of the show. He's been on the podcast before. I interviewed him and we, we talked about the film industry really at large and where Native representation fits into that, how it's fit into it. And that was a great chat. And he's a fellow Navajo brother, so I wanted to bring him on to talk about Dark Winds because... You know, you got to talk to another Navajo about Dark Winds because it's a show about Navajos. And uh, yeah, Marley, introduce yourself. <laughs> That's my Dark Winds introduction. <laughs> uh, yeah, hey, um, you know, I, I, my name is Marley. I'm Navajo. I'm a PhD student in geography at uh, U of A. And I am, I, I am a, a fan of all things Native, especially on the television. So I was pretty excited that you invited me on to talk about this show because, you know, very rarely do we get a chance to talk about Navajo cinema, except for maybe like Code Talkers from like the early 2000s. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if it's not Wind Talkers, we don't get a whole lot to talk about for sure. Right, right. Um, well, let's go ahead and jump into this show. I mean, what's interesting is, you know, this is produced by Robert Redford, but there was an original series, a PBS series for the Tony Hillerman um novels was based on it was five of them that were made and one of them is called dark wind and i think it's interesting that robert redford held on to the production i guess I think he, so when the tony hillman books came out he bought the rights to the show so he could or to the to the books so that he could turn it into a to me movie or tv show and that's how the pbs series spawned and it's interesting that he went and just tried again basically like 20, 30 years later, um, and, and to do it now in this time with George, excuse me, George R. R. Martin. And so I thought that was pretty cool. Um, but if you, of course, this is based on the Tony Hillerman novels. There's 18 of these things, I believe. Um, this particular series is based on two books in particular, the, uh, listening woman and the people of the darkness. And it takes place in the 1970s. The series basically follows two Navajo police officers, Joe Leaphorn and Jim Chi. And so you're asking yourself, like Tony Hillerman, so I used to work in a uh, public library in high school, in Tuba City Public Library. That was my high school job. And in my summers coming back from college, I always worked there too. And in working there, you kind of learn what people like and don't like. And the three authors that got the most play, one, they were donated the most from people, but they, got, they were constantly checked out were Danielle Steele books. Louis L'Amour books and fucking Tony Hillerman novels. Those three were constantly circulating in that library. And so I knew about Tony Hillerman, you know, early on in my, in my life anyway. And I was wondering like, who the heck is this dude? And he's a white dude. He's a white dude from uh, Broken Arrow, Oklahoma, grew up there and he actually attended a native boarding school. Did you know that Marley? He attended an all native, an all now, an all women's uh, native boarding school. I don't know how they let him in, but they let like him and a cohort of like 12 other boys to join for like the first like mixed class. And that's where his quote yeah. unquote fascination with native people began. And then uh, went to World War II, came back. And after World War II, he was a long haul truck driver and had a route going through the res, saw some fellow um, former veterans. You know, he was only 20 at the time when he came back, saw some veterans doing an enemy way ceremony. And that enemy way ceremony got him more fascinated with Navajos. And eventually he started coming back more and more. He got his uh, journalism degree from University of Oklahoma and off to the races from there. Started writing his books, um, got his master's degree from University of New Mexico, where he is like extremely lauded. He, there's like Tony Hillerman departments basically over there. They love that guy and continued to write his books until the end of his life. And then now his uh, wife, I'm sorry, not wife, his daughter, Ann Hillerman, um, continues to write the books and she actually is wrote Bernadette um, into the story. So Bernadette was never in the books. 
until she started writing. So some people, some stands, Tony Hillerman take issue with her being in this show because the timeline doesn't align. But uh, it was great to have a you know a strong native character like uh, Bernadette Manuelito in this one. So it was really good to see. So that's kind of like the quick Tony Hillerman piece. I have much more to say about him later on, um, but that's kind of the quick synopsis. Let's go ahead and jump right into it. Do you have anything quick you want to say? I think real quick, I should just say. Actually, no. I... Go ahead. Mm-hmm, go ahead. I was going to say, I just want to say real quick, I like this show. I'm going to take shots at it and I'm going to nitpick. I think mostly because I'm Navajo, mostly because <laughs> I have issues with Tony Hillerman as a whole. And I think I'm trying to reconcile that in my head as I'm going through this. But the, the issues that I have, um, I'm, I, I can kind of make sense of them in, in my head because I know the native writers and the people involved with the show have their ear to the ground and they'll listen to the people. They'll listen to the, you know, the critical feedback from the native people and the Navajo people. And this is getting a season two. So I'm confident that they'll improve on the things that I might have an issue with and they'll make it better in ways that I didn't anticipate. So what do you think, Marley? What would you give it a 10 out? Like, what would you give it out of 10? You know, when I first saw it, before I did any, any kind of digging at all, I was like, fuck, this is like an eight and a half, like out of 10 for me, eight out of 10. It was just entertaining. Okay. Yeah. I was going to, I was a little bit more critical of it, but then after okay. watching it again, I, I went up, I, like, I think I would say my first initial watching of the series was seven out of 10, you know, and mm. the memes that I made from it and then <laughs> eventually rewatching it again. I was like, yeah, it's not that bad. Like I it's, 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 it's what you get when you use the source material of Tony Hillerman. And it's, I went up to about like 7.9, seven, I just eight out of 10. So like, I think, I think I should also say too, like there's certain things I, will criticize but i think it's like if if what you said is true and that they listen i think we can offer some constructive criticism and maybe get casted on season two (laughs) (laughs) there you go (laughs) fuck yeah there you go (laughs) but yeah no so i'm in the same thing like at first the first time i watched it i was way more critical and then you know i after the second viewing i was like this isn't that bad actually and Mm -hmm. you know i i think i I, I, I hashed through some of the criticisms that I'd seen from other people. And, you know, I think for me, a lot of my criticism stems from like a more materialist approach or like critical theory approach of thinking that's really imbued in like materialism. And, you know, when our last discussion, we talked about Hollywood and capitalism and indigenous representation. And I think there's a lot of examples of that kind of reappearing in a sense that like capital will make movies regardless or like we'll make movies that include native representation regardless if there's native people involved with it so right but yeah and I'll, I, I'll, I'll elaborate on that later but no and i think the next layer of that is casting responsibly not saying they didn't in this one but i think um the attention to detail and just casting is going to be increased in the future. You know, I mean, we always hear like, oh, we're not a monolith talking about native people, people of color really um, have been saying that for a long time, maybe not monolith specifically, but just the idea that we're not all the same. And so it's interesting that you have the stars of the show. You have really just like two Navajos, who's Jeremiah Batui, who plays Father Father So, and Deanna Allison, who plays Emma Leaporn. Everyone else is not Navajo. And to me, that's not an issue, but we I have them. I thought Begay was Navajo. Who what was Ryan Begay, the father that lost the, the daughter? I thought, oh, yeah, yeah, no, no, no. And I, I, would, I wouldn't consider him a star of the show. Um, oh, but yes. fair enough, fair enough. Yeah, yeah. And so, what's interesting is everyone that isn't because there's some fluent ass Navajo in this, you know, like outside of like the non stars, like the Navajo is on point, like it's the legit people who are like are fluent in Navajo. But the people who like speak it predominantly in the show like aren't Navajo, which is interesting. And I think that's a casting, maybe not a flaw, but it goes back to what you're saying about being capitalist. Like it's all about who's going to put butts in the seats, who's marketable, who's the people that, you know, we can like sell this show to and get it greenlit. And it's like, so we're going to throw names that people know, like Kyra Gordon and Tom McLarnon. And that's not an issue to me um, if you write it appropriately and you have, maybe have them speak less. Um, but what's interesting is probably that only matters to Navajos. Most people probably can't even tell the difference, you know, if, 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 it, if it matters at all to, to people. No, I agree. I think, I mean, yeah, for me, I mean, 
you can definitely tell if you're Navajo and you're like, oh, that's not how you pronounce that and whatnot. Yeah. It feels very like stochastic in the way they pronounce things. But I think outside of that, like you said, like, you know, the grandma, when she's speaking in Navajo, I'm like, oh, wow. Okay. That does sound like Navajo. I mean, cause she is Navajo. Um, yeah. And, and so for me, that was something I really appreciated and yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Let's jump into it. So first off, I just want to throw this in there. Tony Hillerman has a Navajo name supposedly, and he was also given an award, special friend to the Navajo Nation back in 81 or 87, one of those two years, whenever Peter McDonald was in office. Um, he said his Navajo name is he who is afraid of his horse. <laughs> and he, he, he brags about that, that he has a Navajo name. And I'm just like, bro, I don't think they liked you if that's the name that they gave you. Um, <laughs> but so uh, he who is afraid of his horse, I got translated from my, from my brother-in-law. It's and so... What's interesting is one, he didn't even bother to learn the actual Navajo name, just like here's my Navajo name. But uh, the special friend to the Navajo Nation, that award is given to him. I feel like that's a very made up award. Before we jump into the cast review, I want your opinion on this, Marley. I have never heard of this award in my life. The only person I could even think that we were giving it to is like, I in my head, I have that like Peterson Zaw. Arnold Schwarzenegger, like girl holding hands and like having their arms raised above them. <laughs> like, I'm like, Arnold probably got a special friend of the Navajo Nation award. Other than that, I can't think of why we would give anybody else that award or I've never heard of it. Have you? You know, it sounds like something Peter McDonald would do. I'll be honest. Because it was, I, I remember seeing that it was like 1987. And I think that's like mm -hmm. the end of McDonald's first like time as uh, chairman. Okay. And so it's like you're the you're the friend of the Dineta. Like, come here, bro. Like you know, like somebody, you know, somebody. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You're my special friend. <laughs> uh, you know, and then because I saw that, and I was like, I don't like. I think like you're right. I think, I think most tribes have these things, but I, specifically to the Navajo, we, we tend to give rewards to people or whatnot. Like what during COVID, was it like Mark Ruffalo was hanging out with like? Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, or yeah, not yeah. Peterson's. Uh, um, Jonathan Nez and yeah. you know, all the Ant Man was on there at one mm -hmm. point. And, and so, like, you know, we, we tend to have these moments where we're like, oh, celebrities here. Let's use the status to pr promote something. But in this case, you know, yeah, special friend of the Nay Tom. Yeah. Like, so okay. what's interesting is it wasn't an innocuous award to him. He flaunted that thing for the rest of his life. His daughter to this day still gives interviews. Dad's proudest moment was being named special friend of the Navajo Nation, despite all of his awards and all his millions of copies sold special friends to the Navajo Nation, that was his like biggest accomplishment. And I'm just like, Jesus fucking Christ, people, like, what are we doing here? But I hope white people uh, give that to one of us. Oh my friends God. Know. White people. <laughs> and special friend of the middle of Ghana. For real. <laughs> I'm going to get my yeah. trophy made of that. Yeah, absolutely. Just get some uh, fucking New Balance shoes on a plaque, right? <laughs> on, a, on a mounted pedestal. Yeah, That'd be exactly. the shit. I mean, the shit. Have it um, done at Chili's or uh, <laughs> Denny's. <laughs> yeah, at Denny's. I love it. I love it. Um, the cast review. No, you know what would be great is special friend of the Navajo Nation. You have that like hardcore um, Biligana dude, that Santa Fe Indian that wears those giant ass like turquoise <laughs> rocks on his fucking <laughs> neck, on his uh, bolo tie. Um, Indian market this weekend, by the way. So keep an eye out for that dude. Uh. All right, yeah, exactly. no, I wish I, I'm over there wishing I had turquoise. <laughs> yeah, for real. Um, cast review. I bet there's a ton of Tony Hillerman fans at that Santa Fe Indian market. It's uh, that just like makes me cringe thinking about. Um, cast review. So executive producers. There's a ton of them. Most notably George R. R. Martin. You know he he's from San. He's from New Mexico area, somewhere in like Taos, Santa Fe area, and. If you didn't know George R. R. Martin, he's older. He actually knew Tony Hillerman. Like they're both authors. Tony Hillerman lived in Santa Fe as well, and so I think he always he always wanted an opportunity to like latch on to his buddy's stories and tell them. And so that's why he was like attached to the show, along with Robert Redford, who you know bought the rights to this long time ago. Um, and then there's others that you know don't really matter. But the most significant other ones are two native people. Star of the show, Zon McLarnon and Chris Ayer. You know, Chris Ayer from so many things, being a pioneer with Smoke Signals. That was his first directed movie. He was director of Skins. Um, he's, uh, I want to say he went to NYU for film school. He's just like an insane resume. And he teaches at uh, IAIA, I believe. Um, and then writers, 
So we got Anthony Flores, who's a pyramid like Paiute, Maya Rose Ditloff, who's Mandan Hidatsa, Erica Tremley, who's Seneca Cayuga, and then Rizal Benali, Navajo, and Billy Luther is Navajo. What was cool is outside of the creator, who's Graham Roland, who's not native, all of the writers on this show are native. And that surprises the hell out of me. I can't believe that happened. One, because in Indian country, there's mixed reviews in general about Tony Hillerman. I mean, Navajo or not, like he, he, he could make the argument that he exploits Navajo culture to an uncomfortable level, like sharing stories and teachings and practices. Like, I still couldn't find out who the hell has been telling him all these stories. I have theories of how he got these stories, but he's got like real legitimate knowledge. And unfortunately, it's not comprehensive and it's not holistic. So he just takes things and runs with it. And so it's out of context. It seems very strange to like Navajo people to be like, why is that said like that? So you get a lot of like stink face reactions of just like, why did he do that? You know, like in the show, when they're showing the Kinalta and they're showing like killings at the same time, they're showing like, I don't know, you're supposed to have something that's supposed to be holy and like sacred. And then you're having like something with like bad energy in the same scene. And it's like, that's a very Tony Hillerman thing to do. Um, and so it's interesting that a group of native writers would latch themselves onto the show and try to make it right. But it's awesome that they have even native writers on this. I never would have thought a show like this would even have native writer, have a native writer, let alone an entire room. What do you think, Marley? Yeah, no, I think for me, you know, my personal experience with Tony Hillerman began with like my grandfather having copies of on his bookshelf. And I just assumed that Tony Hillerman was native, <laughs> uh, you know, cause like I read skinwalkers, I think a coyote waits and, and yeah, like, I think now as I grew up, I was like, wow, this is really uncomfortable as to how yeah. much knowledge he had. And then it got even more, um, I became more aware of it once I realized he was white, non-native. Yeah. And you it's know, got native me, ass covers too on all right. of his books. So exactly. I, I I always thought the same thing. I just thought like, oh, he's a native dude. Right. Like I was like, who the artwork really sells it too. And you know, so for me, I was like for a long time, I was like, oh, this is nice. Like I enjoy reading these, but you know, in the back of my mind, I'm remembering what my grandmother said about certain practices, etc. You know, think taboos. And when I found out he was white, I was really surprised. And right. You know, and I think everyone has their own criticism of it. And I think they're all valid for the most part, um, especially with just the fact that he kind of was just like a, I, th I mean, it makes, I'm surprised it was a journalism degree and not like an anthropologist degree because <laughs> it's literally like the trademark of that. Um, Cause at least with like journalism, you're supposed to have some type of ethics. Uh, whereas anthropology, <laughs> they're still trying to figure that shit out. Uh, but yeah, 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 yeah. You know, so I, for me, it's like, I recognize the critiques of Tony Hillerman, but I also recognize that he does have like a cultural, I don't want to say impact, but he's kind of like stitched in to like Navajo culture. Uh, Absolutely. And, and I'm not referring to like culture in the sense of like capital T tradition, but like more of like a sense of like culture that's like living and practice all day. Like people, you know, I, one of the things I wanted to do was do a movie review of all the movies and read the books of Tony Hillerman. That's a good do one. It like the commentary tracks where we just make fun of it. Like, ooh, because at, at the end of the God, day, we still got to do that riff tracks, man. That'd be the shit. Right. I, I yeah. know. Like a riff track would be amazing. But like, that's it. Like for me, that's how I see Tony Hillerman is, you know, I, the books are already published. The least thing we can do is like, you know, kind of make fun of the little things that we can, <laughs> yeah. um, but also be critical of it and offer like actual criticisms of it. Um, and yeah, and it, a lot of it just stemmed from my own personal experience of just finding Tony Hillerman books in my grandfather's office and in his little shelf and being intrigued by the design and the fact that there's a author who's willing to write mysteries that are surrounded by Navajo culture. Yeah. And the titles, I think we're really, were just like, wow, this guy has like deep knowledge. Like he's talking about monster slayers and you know, the, 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 the Tolly Hillerman books, like just the titles in itself, or you're, you're just like, this guy knows a lot. Like one of his books is called Blessing Way. Another one, you know, The Dark Wind is this one. He has Skinwalkers. I've never heard anybody talk about Skinwalkers outside of that book um, <laughs> to that level, you know, outside of like Skinwalker Ranch. Like this guy really knows what the hell he's talking about to a degree. And I think that's what makes it uh, scary. You know, another one of his books is Sacred Clowns. You know, he even like gets into like Zuni and Hopi culture too. And it's just like, who the hell was feeding him this information? Because something that he 
from the books that I've seen is he never credited anybody. Right. Like he never credited, like, here's this elder that, you know, reached out or I reached out to this person, extended an olive branch, you know, they extended the olive branch and, you know, we're willing to share. I think that was the part that really irked me is like, if he had a connection, you know, reveal it, not from like a, Hey, we need to chastise that person, but just to give credit because he got pretty arrogant toward the end of his life to where he was just like, I know way more about Navajo culture than Navajo people. He said that in most Navajo people is what he said in a UCLA interview back in, uh, gosh, I want to say like 71, something like that. And I was just like, Jesus Christ, man, this guy's like, has such a huge ego. Um, but it makes me think like, I really want to know like, who the hell was he talking to? Who fed him his information? Not because it's inaccurate, but just because like, how did he gain that level of trust? You know? Right. Right. I think that's a good point. I, I mean, this, this might be a slight tangent, but the whole Tony Hillerman effect, I'll call it that because I'm retrofitting all the things I was thinking about, but like, you know how you see on YouTube where it's like a white person that goes like goes to the Navajo Nation and goes, white person blows away Navajo people by speaking their language like carefully <laughs> yeah. and more like really efficient, like, you know, in a, yeah, in, in yeah. a very like good way. And you see these <laughs> Navajo people looking at this white person. But then I notice, and this is, I, I suspect, and this is my theory, is that in that YouTube video, I mean, I saw a lot of Na- Navajo people older than us, like I think a generation above. Older. And, Right. Yeah. And older who are like praising this person, be like, yeah, see, this is, this is what, um, if this white person can learn their language, why can't you? And it was, it was pretty much weaponized against us and without right. the context of colonialism. And I think, I think there's, I would, I wouldn't be surprised if Tony Hillerman had that same effect where he Ooh. embedded himself in tradition, got to know a lot of Native people, was respectful yes. enough to gain trust. And then eventually, Natives just, fed him some information, you know, or even it, it couldn't, it might even not even be in a very formal process of sitting down, but just like talking to him. And then he just had a notebook and he just scribbled everything down before he forgot. And then next thing you know, he has like stories. Like I, I suspected something like that because, you know, I think native Navajo people, you know, uh, maybe I'm making a really gross general. No, it's but okay. Like, like but make it make, gross. I like it. <laughs> like we, we, we tended to like, we, we get friendly, you know, and we're very impressed by non Navajos who like know about Navajo history and to the point where we kind of just feed them information. Like, I'll be honest, like, yeah, you know, when I think pr- prior to all of like the uh, early two thousands, uh, I'm sorry, early 2010s, like skinwalkers weren't really known, but now you have like mm-hmm. everybody talking about skinwalkers on like those YouTube channels about skinwalker stories, you know, people just, proliferating and just distributing all these like fake stories that you can tell are fake if you're navajo because they use the term skinwalker yeah. and you're yeah. like that's not a skinwalker story um but like yeah and you know like prior to all of that you know the few people that did talk to me like well what are skinwalkers i felt like oh wow this is cool this person knows about my culture. right <laughs> i mean not that I'm, saying I'm a skinwalker i but did like, the exact same thing i went to yeah. prep school i went to prep school back east in um andover massachusetts and um you know for the summers same exact thing once they hear I was Navajo, like skinwalkers eventually came up. Like, what do you know about skinwalkers? And I would tell them stories, at least like, you know, like the stuff you tell, like on a bus ride from home. And they were just like fascinated. And that stuck with me because I was like, oh, wow, I have like, I have agency, you know, you by knowing these clout. stories. You got mm-hmm. clout. No, you're just kidding. No, that was, that was no, the first clout. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, first but clout. Yeah, yeah, like cultural, court. like you have something that they are find interesting and then it mm-hmm. establishes. And I think that's what Tony Hillerman is. I think maybe there wasn't just one person. He just embedded himself in a lot of Navajos and just picked up tidbits here and there. And, and that might explain why you said it's just not coherent or it doesn't feel very yeah. realistic is because God, you're getting tidbits here and there. You're fucking parallel to that guy. I want to say his name is Shalmanik. Um, he's a, uh, he's a white dude who like speaks other languages on YouTube. This guy has like millions of followers on YouTube but he's a white guy that speaks like fluent Chinese. You know, his wife is Chinese. He went to study like Beijing, studied in Beijing for years. And so he'll go into like the um, Chinese speaking parts of like New York, primarily where he lives. And he'll like go up to them and speak. You know, he just looks like a Mormon white dude, basically like the whitest of the white. And he'll just show up speaking these like (laughs) deep, deep, like small village dialects, like versions of like Mandarin and Cantonese and surprises the fuck out of people and does it with all kinds of languages. And he takes it on as a challenge because he's like fancies himself as a linguist. He did that with Navajo. He tried to learn Navajo like over the course of like a couple of weeks and then went to the res and popped his head into a few like shops 
and spoke like pedestrian Navajo, just very, very basic. Right. What's interesting is that how that same standard that was applied, we'd get shit on if that was me and you trying to talk to the same Navajo people with that <laughs> level of knowledge, the level of Navajo. But that's just like well, you Navajo. know what they would say? They they would say you sound like a white person. <laughs> and then they'd be like, wait a minute, how dare you? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, but they shower that dude, you know, he, they, they were like, Hey, come stay in my hole going for the night. You know, this person invited him over and they brought him in and <laughs> you are, you single? <laughs> yeah. Uh, you yeah. Meet my no, I, I you agree. Meet my daughter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, it's, it's one of those things again, like it, I mean, I know we, this is kind of like a whole, uh, like I said, a tangent, but it, like, I think it illustrates like. A, a point that I want to make later about like reclaiming these stories, but moving away from Tony Hillerman, you know, mm-hmm. um, because you know, they're tidbits, they're, they're incoherent, you know, and <clears throat> that doesn't necessarily mean we have to like put forth a whole holistic Navajo philosophy yeah. in the next season, but you know, we, we become more aware and we're more respectful about what we put on the, on the big screen, I guess. And I think to add to your point, I feel like they are going away from it the hardcore like Hillerman stands their biggest critique is that this is way different than the books already. And I'm just like, good. Like, I like that. I want them to like take it just as like a framework, like a scaffold and then just make it its own thing. Like, I love that they brought Bernadette Manuelito in, even though she's like way later in the Hillerman kind of universe. Like, I love that they're already doing that because it's what you said. It's making it a new thing. It's going to make it a more relevant, a more, I mean, an accurate, but it's going to make it something that's more respectful and yeah, I like it. I just want to let people know, listening, I always had a crush on Bernadette. I never cared for Janet Pete in the stories <laughs> and in the show. I'm just saying, I'm just All saying, right. <laughs> cause I know, I know there's that one little moment where they were like, is, is, I, I guess I shouldn't spoil it. Never mind. I'm just going to leave it at that. Uh, I think good. I might spoil it by mentioning Janet Pete. <laughs> Janet Pete. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm team, team Bernadette. Team Bernadette. I love it. Um, so writer's room, native, native writer's room. We didn't even, we got on such a tangent. We didn't even talk about that. <laughs> you had a story about Roselle that you wanted to tell. You heard her on yeah, the yeah. calling. Totally. I, okay. So I think what drew me to the show was the amount of native writers, right? Like just mm-hmm. a lot of them besides I think Graham Roland. And I listened to this podcast, uh, native American calling, I think, yeah, the broadcast and yep. they had Roselle on there and she, she already, I'm assuming that's how she identifies, but she already anticipated the criticisms that they would get for adopting Tony Hillerman and putting it on the big screen. And, Mm. you know, and I think she had one really good comment that speaks to our last conversation about the role of capital and capitalists who control where money is um, allocated, et cetera. And in this case, she said that I'm going to sum it up, but like, you know, as a response to like, how do people like, what are, what are your response to people who are critical of putting this type of uh, source material on, on the screen, despite it's critical or very limited representation of indigenous people. And she said, they're going to do it without us, you know, like mm. they, they're, they're going to do it without us. The least we can do is at least participate to mitigate. I would, I'm saying mitigate, but at least give mm-hmm. a, a more, um, better representation that we're not like put on the screen as like flat subjects passive Fuck. agents and i i was like that's the point like i think that gets to that, the point that's really noble when you look at it that way right and 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 i think like and and that's why like after listening to that podcast and then re-watching it i was like oh, okay i see because that's it like that's hollywood hollywood is going to make movies with or without natives and the least we can do is at least ascribe some control over the our own depictions and this comes from like the large settler colonial history that's heavily embedded with capitalism and racial capitalism specifically, but also, you know, the, the histories of land dispossession and enslavement and Hollywood has much to benefit um, from its racist depiction prior. Now it's like, okay, it's kind of gone, uh, become more self-aware. Mm. And in this case, it's like, they're going to do it with you or without you, man. And, you know, the least you can do is try to participate in a meaningful way. And, you know, cause who knows this show could have been much worse if it was oh, absolutely native writers. Cause like, you know I what, you know what? Nine, nine, nine out of 10 for me now. 
and that knowing all of that. <laughs> Yo, nah, fuck nah, it, I'm going up. I'm going up, yeah, boys. Fuck it. 11, yeah, let's crank it up to 11. <laughs> fuck it. Yeah, 15 yeah. out of 10. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, and, and I thought that comment was sums up the the pragmatism that native it, like native writers as individuals and maybe eventually collective writers can assert in these large projects is that like they know okay we, we, they're going to do it without us at least what we can do is try to soften it and i think it benefited from that um and and so for me i thought that was really interesting and speaks to why i don't i'm not really critical of it um at the same time na- native people got paid like you know for I real I, like i know i know to I, film this you know the t- uh i can't say one of the native nations uh tes tesaki pueblo tesuki tesuki yeah. pueblo you know they converted one of their old gambling areas into camel rock studios and this is where yep. the book dark went so they got money out of this you know like this is why i'm like okay eventually our politics are either going to be symbolic or materialist. And it's going to be mm-hmm. like a push and pull between both of them. And this show kind of reveals like the pragmatism of engaging with politics of representation, but also the politics of, you know, material gains of like, at least some people got paid for this. And yeah, so yeah, I really thought that was really interesting. And, and it was only, as far as I remember, it was only Rizal who spoke on that subject. But, but I think I'm- that's generally... Absolutely. How native writers engage with these productions is that they're going to do it without me. So I might as well do my best to make sure we don't look like, you know, noble savages, et cetera. Yeah, no. And, and I think that you really, I think that's really going to help me in the future evaluate native film when there is like poor representation. And then like just this one native actor, it's just like, well, that native actor probably tried their ass off to do what they could behind the scenes, you know, giving feedback to the writers, giving feedback to the directors, trying to pitch their you know for their their native cohort their native friends that they are they don't know are actors and writers to the producers and maybe just got no attraction like i don't know you know i think some people are just like, oh it's a fucking sellout you know and uh <laughs> it's just like no maybe not you know like maybe they maybe they're not a sellout maybe they tried their best and so i think that's why this show like i want to say that i like it i'm gonna shit on it at certain points because that's a part of the show is like I got I'm shitting talk. on you because I love you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm whipping you because I love you. Yeah, no, that's exactly what this is. Um, so yeah, let's um, that was great. That was great. Let's keep this let's keep this shit rolling. Um, let's jump into the uh, the cast. And so, what's interesting about this cast is it's like a who's who uh, when it comes to Indian country um, for that for the for the writer. Oh, I'm sorry the the actors that are represented in here because man, it's got Zon McLarnon who plays Joe Leaporn. He's the coda. He's it's debatable. I think he's a better leap horn than Fred Ward, who is in Skinwalker. I'm sorry. <laughs> in uh, dark war, dark wind, but uh, West Studi also played Joe Leaporn. So those two can fucking cage fight it out. So who's the alpha Joe Leaporn? Ooh. Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, Zaw McLarnon, though, he loves playing cops. He's big in Res Dogs. He's Officer Matthias and Longmore. Um, he's been in Westworld, the Fargo TV series. He was Hansi Dent in that one. Fucking badass in that one. Oh, I love that. Yeah. I'll, I'll review that one later. That one's a badass show. Um, second season, so cool. Kyle Gordon, he plays Jim Chi. He's qualified. So Jim Chi, he was previously played by Adam Beach and Lou Devin Phillips in the PBS movies. Jim Chi in the book graduated from UNM. And is looking to become a medicine man. And so his character is very different in this series. You know, he went mm-hmm. to Berkeley. He's an FBI agent in this one, an undercover FBI agent. So they're definitely going off script off from the books, which is great. And, you know, we kind of talked about that. But Kiowa was Embry Call in the Twilight series, Lifestyle and Blood Quantum. He's in Res Dogs as Bunny Tiger. Um, he was in the Liberator Netflix series. And he's in uh, Roswell, New Mexico. You know, he makes a few appearances there. Any, anything to say about those two? Um, no, I mean, I, I think f- for Zon McLaren, I've, I've always enjoyed his, his acting chops. Like, I don't know which came first, but for sure, Fargo as H- Hansi Dent, I was like, holy shit, this is amazing. And then, you know, even in um, Westworld, mm-hmm. I, I really loved his character. Like, there are moments where he was, talking, I was crying out. I was like, oh shit. Like, I mean, in the worst part, I mean, I, I'm not going to spoil it, but yeah, like, I was just like, yo, you killed it. And then Reservation Dogs, amazing. Uh, Kyle Gordon, I think, yeah, I think he's a good actor. Like, I enjoyed him in Blood Quantum. Like, he scared me at the, I was like, yo, mm-hmm. I don't want to, I don't ever want a brother like that, you know? Yeah, um, for real. 
you know, so I was like, okay, like these are good actors who are, I think, doing a good job. Um, but I, I generally like what they do and I enjoy the work that they do. And I think a lot of their characters leave impressions on me. I'm not too familiar with Kyle Gordon. Like I only seen blood quantum, but yeah. that performance, you know, freaked the hell out of me. I think it's one of those parts from, it's why I don't really return to that movie because mm-hmm. it's too, I'm like, oh, I'm going to take yeah. a break. Yeah. But I, yeah, it's because he's a good, a good actor in that movie. So, yeah, that, yeah. That shit was like Chris, uh, seat gripping. It was like, it was really good. Um, you know Jeff Barnby who directed that. I thought he should have directed Prey. Like that shit would have been off. Like that shit would have been insane. But um, Kyle Gordon. What I like most is I think Kyle Gordon is a fantastic actor. Um, I've seen him in like Shadow Wolves, which I think was a shit movie, but he did great in that one. Like all of his roles that I've followed, um, like every role that I've seen him in, I'm like, man, this guy's a really good actor. It's unfortunate though that he's tied to the Twilight movies. So he's kind of got like that Robert Pattinson kind of stink on him where Robert Pattinson's a fucking phenomenal actor. You know, if you've seen Good Time, you've seen all this like light, like Lighthouse, you're just like, Jesus fucking Christ, like this guy can act his ass off. But he just has to have enough like work in between Twilight to distance himself from this. And I think that's why I'm excited for Kiowa for this and like Reservation Dogs when I saw him in it. It's like he'll distance himself from that and he'll be able to like not reinvent himself, but he'll be able to like just become like he's just known as a great actor. And this AMC Plus show, fucking great platform for that. So next yeah, is I, go, ahead, go ahead. I was going to say, I think one of the iterations, I don't know if we want to spend time on this, but actually I, we'll, we'll keep going because I was going to talk about the different portrayals of these characters, but I think we can go keep moving through the cast. Okay. Um, next, we got Jessica Matten as Bernadette Manuelito. She's a descendant of the Métis. That's all I could find online. Um, she's, some, she's First Nations from Canada. She's previously in um, Frontier, the TV show that had Jason Momoa in it. Tribal TV show that was on APTN. She plays Sam Woodburn. That was like the star of the show, basically. Um, her character, like I said, comes later in the book. I like that they brought her in. Um, yeah, pretty cool. Next is Deanna Allison, who I'm related to. My last name is Allison, so I thought it was pretty cool. Uh, she plays Emma Leaphorn. She is Navajo. She's like the only Navajo in this starting lineup, so I thought it was great. Um, but she plays Joe's wife. She definitely does a great job. What I thought was cool is she has a huge gap in her filmography. She's only credited two movies in IMDb, and her first one was back in like 2002 as in Edge of America as Marissa. And I was like, I knew I saw her from somewhere. Um, I knew I saw her in another movie, but I didn't realize it was that long ago. So I'm surprised they made the reach and tried to get her for this one. And, and the actors were really surprised that she would come on board because she had such a gap in her history. But then, you know, she killed it. She did such a great job. Uh, and then next, Elva Guerrero, Sally Growing Thunder. She's Ponca. She's in Res Dogs as Jackie. She's the pregnant daughter to Ada Growing Thunder, who's the witch in this one. Yeah, Jeremiah Vitsui. Actually, I should jump to Ada Growing Thunder, played by Amelia Rico. Amelia Rico is, I um, can't remember what she is. She's indigenous from, I uh, can't remember her tribe that she's from. But she was in like Grey's Anatomy. She was in a few other pieces of work, but Grey's Anatomy is the biggest one I remember. And she killed it. She was terrifying in this show. Um, Millie Rico, shout out to her. That was she. She was terrifying in this show. Jeremiah Vitsui, father so who turned out to be Hosky. Uh, he's Navajo as well. He's the only other Navajo really with like a major speaking role. Uh, he's in Yellowstone, Breaking Bad, Better Call Saul. And you got Eugene Brave Rock who plays Frank Nakai. Frank Nakai, not sure which one. Eugene Brave Rock's Black Blackfoot. He was in Wonder Woman, The Revenant. And then I want to shout this one out. Natalie Benali, friend of the show, previous guest on the show. Natalie Benali plays Natalie Bluehouse. It really reached on that one, but Natalie Bluehouse. And uh, I just want to say she's Navajo as well. So freaking happy for her. She's in episode five and episode six. And it's just really good to see her really get a shot. And she's got more work coming. She's mentioned to me before. Um, 
And so I'm really excited to see what, what she has coming up in, in bigger roles. And that's cool. And for the non-natives, you got like Rain Wilson as the car sales car dealership owner. And then Noah Emmerich as Agent Whitover, aka High Pockets. And that's kind of it for the cash review. Got anything, Marley? I, I think you I a lot of these people I'm not too familiar with, besides, of course, Dwight from the office. <laughs> and I mean, I let me see. I'm I'm going through again to make sure I got the names right. Okay, so um yeah, so I don't really know Jessica Mateen. Diana Allison, I think, is from Farmington, if I remember correctly. So yep, yep, yep. Um, I really, yeah, Elva Guerrera did really well. I think she's kind of blossoming into her own character. Of course, Jeremy Bitsui. I was like, my my only criticism I was like, you were so, like, I, like the moment I saw this person, I was like, yeah, you're you're the bad guy. <laughs> like, there's <laughs> there's no there's no if ands and buts. Um, and then Noah Emmerich is just one of those like character actors who just like plays random people, but he's always remembering because you're like, hey, I know that guy. Like, I remember him from The Walking Dead at mm. the end of that season. Um, and then Ryan Begay who. I was kind of happy to see, I shouldn't say kind of, but I was happy to see that he's getting more work. But I remember he was in this real, like, I don't independent horror movie. And if I ever got the chance, I'd ask him about it because I never understood the plot of that movie. <laughs> um, and I wanted to see if he could clarify it. But yeah, I, I was pretty, you know, I, I, a lot of some of these names look familiar. Some of, some of the faces look familiar too. And so, um, yeah, I, I, I think, again, I was like, I think this is one of those shows where, they draw upon some native actors, predominantly native actors, and it helps the show feel a little bit more real. For sure. And I think, you know, before we jump into the plot review, it's just the background actors, they were all legit. The background actors were all Navajo. They all spoke fluent Navajo, which was crazy. And I think when you juxtapose the, the fluency skills of the stars and the Navajo background actors, I think that's where it really becomes more apparent kind of the uh, fluency issues. But like I said, that's more of a nitpick. Non-Navajos probably won't even notice the difference. Like there's subtitles, it comes off fine. Like it's not like anybody in the show is like, what? That's weird. You know, it's, it's it comes off great. So yeah, I, I spent my whole time looking at the background actors being like, are they Navajo? Are they not? Are they Navajo? But I think <laughs> <laughs> it was just like that uh, Leonardo DiCaprio meme where I was just pointing. And I'm like, uh, I think so. But yeah. Yeah, 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 for real. So we're going to do something different today. We've been chugging along for a while just talking about the show. Going to skip the plot review. It's kind of no point. I think we're just going to jump into some of the things that we thought were cool and maybe not cool about the about the show. Let's just jump into the positives. Going to skip Ooh. the plot review. We're going to we're going to we're going to mix it up. Oh well, I don't know. Are you a negative person? So usually I go positives, negatives, and final thoughts. Where I usually have like positives and an uplifting note. How do you want to do this? I think let's go with your traditional structure. I'm not. I'm... All right, let's do it. So positives. The all native writers room is evident. This shows the shit. I mean, ultimately, starting with the titles of every single episode. So I want to read the titles. The title of the first episode is Monster Slayer. The next one is The Male Rain Approaches. Super Navajo thing to say. Uh, third is K'e, which is our like kinship system. The number four is Hoande. Number five is Ha'inle. Number six is Hojo Nasha. So the fact that you have Navajo titles for like three of those things. If you've ever watched Breaking Bad, there's an episode called Tohajali. I thought that was a one-off. I thought I would never see a Navajo name in the title of a TV show, like ever. I thought like, man, Breaking Bad did it. And that's that's all it was ever going to be. So for this to have three three episodes with Navajo names is fucking awesome. I don't know what you think, Marley. No, I was happy to see that. I mean, for me, that helps like, at least again, like anytime you can ground it and make it feel like it's actually in a native community is very helpful to, I guess, the suspension of disbelief. Um, and for me, like, yeah, reading those titles and then trying to square it squared into like the actual plot of each episode was kind of helpful but at the same time it's it's nice just seeing navajo like language you know that isn't like um you know from the x-files or some shit like that and you know for me i think <laughs> i'm always happy to see navajo language on tv right um and it, it, there's a long you know i mean I, i'm a geography student so even just seeing like place names and um, places, you know, streets being using like Navajo language and that ongoing push for native that that native nations are doing to like reclaim and um, reinscribe these meanings, I think is, is very nice. And so 
for me, that was definitely a plus of seeing the uh, episode titles. Awesome. Awesome. You want to go with a positive you have? Yeah, I think. Ooh, okay. So I, like you said, the writers, you said the titles. I think the filmography was pretty good. I, I There mm. are moments where I think I was like, oh, this is capturing it nice. And the shots, the landscape shots that they were able to capture the way that, you know, there are some shots. I, I'm not like a filmographer person, but like there were like low camera angles to capture the landscape in the background. Um, you know, there were some, you know, points that I was like, ah, oh, that could have been done better. But like I said, I'm not, I think generally the filmography really captures the landscape of like the background and the beauty of like the Southwest nice. and the four corners area. The music was good. Definitely had that vibe of like, this is kind of like a game of Thrones kind of idea for music sure. Wise, Cause I was like, this, this feels like game of Thrones, which confirms my theory that like Jay, uh, George R. R. Martin made the Dothraki after Native people. Uh, <laughs> I didn't know he. I didn't know he came from New Mexico. So I'm like, oh, that sounds. Uh, um, I don't that, know if that's where he came from, but that's where he resides for a oh, long okay. time. Well, I, I'm going to stick to that theory. Um, nice. And then I like fin- it. Finally, I think the time period. Like I think the way they were able to capture the 70s, they did not too bad to be honest. Because they did always, great. It's always one of those struggles where, like, the moment you see something out of place, out of like time, you're like, wait a minute, I'm taking out. Why is that there? Like, and I think they did a really good job um, to to really capture those aesthetics and the trucks. Like, there were trucks in there that I was like, oh, I wish I had that truck, or I wish I had that car, uh, and you know, little gadgets that I saw that I was like, that's something my grandmother had, or that's like in one of the photos that she had when she was younger. Um, so I think they really captured the time period well um, within just like utilizing the background and utilize utilizing um clothing and the vehicles i thought you know really immersed me in the 70s absolutely i want to know what the hell um joe lee porn was driving like that was like i'm like that's a 70s fucking police squad car like that was that big ass suv that he was driving i think it was awesome Yo, I wish that that's like something like if you have that and you're like a single man and you like are trying to impress your in-laws, <laughs> that, truck, that shit's like the night. That's like a that's an easy way. And you're just like, yo, I'll haul some wood or like I'll I'll take some sheep somewhere <laughs> like that. I saw that truck and I was like, yo, I don't believe in masculinity. But if I was driving that truck, <laughs> I would have a very firm, like masculine sense of self. Yeah, that's masculine <laughs> as fuck. Yeah, for real. Uh, that, that, that vehicles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love I really like that vehicle. Um, I'm gonna fi- hit skinwalkers with that truck. That's, that's like I was like, if I see something a skinwalker running across, I'm just pressing the gas. I, I'm just going. <laughs> yeah, it. fuck it. Yeah, <laughs> they got no chance of making it with that shit. I love it. Yeah, that's a zombie apocalypse truck right there. I like how big it was. It was amazing. And Zom McLaren's kind of a little dude, five six, so it made it look like really big. <laughs> Maybe it's just a regular truck. <laughs> oh, it's just, oh, I'm just kidding. It's I'm like sorry, a, Zom. It's like a GMC Jimmy or something, and he's like, just, <laughs> "Look at that massive ass vehicle!" Yeah. Oh uh, uh, yeah. Um, let me go to the other positives. So, uh, native producer on the show, you got Zon, you got Chris Ayer. I think it's. I mean, that's the that's the highest you can go, really. Um, without being the creator of the show, um, you have full latitude really to be at the, at the seat of the table to say, this is what I want. And I think it's evident that Chris Ayer and Tom McLarnan pushed in the direction of, I want more accurate representation. Mm-hmm. And without them, who knows what the hell this would look like. And I go back to Rizal's comment. They were going to make this with or without me. And I wonder if Chris Ayer and Zahn had the same kind of thought process of just like, if they're approaching me about this opportunity, one, put my name on the fucking map, give me more opportunities. But more importantly, they're going to make this without me. Who the hell are they going to ask down the road after me? Like, I need to take this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. go ahead. No, I was going to say, I agree. I mean, I think even just like, because Chris Hare did what? I mean, for sure he did. Uh, was it? Um, oh, my goodness. I'm losing my native card by not knowing uh, this this famous native movie. That has Adam B. Skin, here. smoke signals, smoke signals. And, you know, but he also did skinwalkers like he directed that. So mm-hmm. he has an idea as to what makes the res look like the res or at least what kind of landscapes are necessary, because I could only imagine them doing this, you know, somewhere completely not doesn't even look like the Southwest. And I think Absolutely. having that kind of power to be like, no, this is where we should do it. This is like the logistics behind it um, really helps, like at least me 
feel like this is <laughs> about native people. Yeah. Yeah. And I think what I liked about it too, is it's, even though it's a super native show, like at least the content, it didn't really feel that native. When you watch the old TV show, that feels super fucking Navajo. When you watch the old PBS series, like even though they speak less Navajo than this show, it feels really fucking like Navajo. And you know, um, I would disagree with that actually. Really? I just I think this one feels more Navajo than those ones. And reason no why is okay. I, I I wasn't sure when to bring this up, but I'll say it as a negative because let's do it. Let's do it. Um, I, it's actually a positive to this show actually because the PBS ones, a lot of them, like okay, let's take um skinwalker that was filmed like in phoenix area like mm-hmm. and it only had one spot in the navajo nation uh but you can tell because it looks like the surrounding area of phoenix it looks like Otham land you know mm-hmm. apache land and i was like and that's one the one thing that i noticed with this show is um you know with with the 2022 dark winds is that like there are places where i'm like oh i know that place i know that place or like i would know it here my only gripe was there are places where I'm like, that's not Navajo land. That, you didn't film that. Like, that's Pueblo mm-hmm. land. Like, I could tell. Um, whereas if we go back to the 1991 Dark Wind singular, all of that was filmed on the Navajo Nation. Yeah, Most that was all in Tuba was. City. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To Western Agency. And that, that that to me is like where um, Dark Wind's season two needs to go in that direction of just filming on location. Because if Absolutely. they have everything, they could knock it out of the park to like really feel in combat like this for me it was like geographical anxiety where like you know i i was like wait we're in the navajo nation we're we're in regarding the 2022 dark winds okay they were like oh we got to go to canyon de Shea. and then you see this this long landscape shot of a truck going through monument valley and you're like why are they going through monument valley <laughs> yeah, if they're trying real. to get to you know canyon de Shea? yeah and then and then they're saying i think they're saying that their office is in kienta but I'm yeah. like, but my Monument Valley is north. Like you got to go south. And then, yeah. you know, even Gallup didn't really look like Gallup. It looked like some like um, the Pueblo town. Uh, yeah. When know. they were like, you know, well, they, we got to go to Gallup. I'm like, that's too fucking nice to be Gallup. Where the fuck are you right now? <laughs> exactly. You're, you're somewhere in New Mexico. There are somewhere right. in a nice part of New Mexico. It, yeah, no it looks way. like Santa Fe. Yeah. It looks like a, 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 mm-hmm. a lesser income of Santa Fe. <laughs> right. And, and so, and so it's a positive in a sense that I, for me, it feels more Navajo than PBS, a coyote wakes because those you can see are just films in Phoenix or some metropolitan area. I think, um, is it a coyote waits or is it a thief in time? One of those is filmed in Albuquerque and they have very similar landscapes that I'm like, Mm -hmm. okay, this is why they feel the same. But in relation to the PBS show, the AMC show feels more Navajo because it has more geography involved in it. Whereas in relation to the 1991 movie, which has a different plot, it that one feels way more Navajo because you you see the roads, you see the like um, the landmarks. Like my my um, trading post that's closer to my grandmother's house is in that show. They renamed it. I think no it's called shit. It Burning Water, and I'm like, that's that's my grandma's house. Like I I, I couldn't see my grandma's badass. house, but there are places where they filmed that. I'm like, I've been to that windmill. Like I know where that's at, hmm. and so. You know, so it's like a positive and negative. And I think um, for me, this show does really well better than the PBS show is that it does that. Like it has Navajo speaking and it kind of takes place on the Navajo nation that you recognize it. Granted, yeah. it's, you know, not perfect. Absolutely. Uh, they, thank you for that one. That was a good, that was a great positive. Um, I think I agree with, I agree, I agree for the most part. I think I can't put my finger on why I can't, why I'm saying it, it doesn't feel native. I think because it was more entertaining than anything you're kind of just focused on the action and kind of the the thriller aspect of the show that you kind of get lost in just the plot and the the i mean the witchcraft i think is the most prevalent like native thing in the show everything else is kind of just like it's it's so like sub sub layer it's just kind of off happening in the background um but next point is uh you know casting is strong that's a huge positive I mean, regardless of the fact that you don't have any like non Navajos, you know, that you have non Navajos primarily with as the stars, like fuck it, you know, like what Marley said, like they're getting bread, they're getting paid. This is going to boost up their filmography. This is going to boost their notoriety. This is going to make other people, non Native people who aren't like plugged into the Native film scene, be like, who the hell is Kyle Gordon, you know, and who the hell is Eugene Brave Rock? Who the hell is Al McLaren? You know, I, I recognize that dude from somewhere, Jessica Matten. You know, our friend Natalie Benali, like 
all these people are going to get extra like shots on the goal to do more amazing things or just as amazing things down the road. And I had gripes about the non Navajos who spoke Navajo, but that's about it. Like the casting is amazing. You know, like the Navajos in the background were amazing. I hope more of them get pulled forward to the front of the stage in the next seasons. But I mean, they fucking tried. You can tell they tried. It's better. I don't know. I don't know if I would have rather had them speak no Navajo or put the effort forward and tried to have non non Navajo speak Navajo. Um, but I don't know. I mean, they, they, they made the effort, you know, they had Navajo language, uh, language coaches on site. They like gave an honest effort to make it happen. And a for effort, and the execution, you know, that's like the shitty Navajo and me going back to our story about, um, Shao Mink, the white dude who can speak Navajo to me and you trying to speak Navajo and we'll get shit on for having the same proficiency level as him. Like I kind of hold that standard to these people, which is grossly unfair. And so I think if I really came to terms with the fact that like Navajo is fucking hard to learn, it's a whole nother language. I'm just like, yeah, you know, it was pretty good. So the casting was really strong. What did you think? No, I, I, I agree with everything you said, and it's not because you invited me to the show. <laughs> um, I, the point I really want that you brought up is I think the casting's good. The writing is good. And these can be improved. And like you said, you know, when we're I, as people who consume this media, we're very critical of native stuff like where we have to like they have to be on the level of like Game of Thrones writing. And mm-hmm. I was listening to this podcast. It's called Frames Per Second. It's um, a black podcast where they talk about movies and whatnot. And one of the folks on there, I forgot exactly who, but they made this good point in regard to movies produced and made predominantly by black people. And they said, we're so harsh on this movie. You know, we put this to the, we, we try to compare this to like Titanic, Jurassic Park, et cetera. And, you know, we hold it to this high standard, but why don't we do that to like predominantly white movies? Like if you go to like a hundred worst movies of all time, the, the, the one, you know, all of them are like produced by white people for the mm-hmm. most part, but we don't, you know, but we don't have that issue of like being critical of them. And I think the point that they were making, if I remember correctly, is that we have to let writers and actors who are native grow we can't expect them to be a hundred percent amazing actors and then that every time they it's just a plus a plus like we have to have duds we have to have uh, mistakes we have to have bad movies and i think that's something for me in relation to like looking at how capitalism shapes indigenous representation but also the fact that and sometimes it just doesn't have to include indigenous Mm -hmm. writers and whatnot the other aspect is when it comes to the way we consume media uh we hold it to the standards of like Titanic um, or whatever, you know, greatest movies of all time versus like, this is, this movie is way better than Mac and me. It's way better. (laughs) Yeah. Way better than Mac and me. (laughs) Right. It's way better than like um, zoom from 2006, the fog, you know, the 2005, you know, all these like terrible movies that exist, you know, movie 43 being like this, like these are people would choose these over that. And I think, when you criticize this, and this is something I had to like think about, you know, I was making memes and I was like, oh, this, this, they should have redid this or that, that shot could have done uh, a do over. I then realized like I'm being so critical on them, but this is literally the first time, you know, a lot of new actors and I shouldn't be so harsh on them. And I should just kind of enjoy the fact that they had this opportunity. They got even the writers too. They don't right, have exactly. a long. Yeah. You, you, the, yeah. Like our writers should have space to make mistakes. And to put out some bad writing or some, you know, tropes, whatever, who cares? Because as native people, we have to consume all this other media that's predominantly made by white people. And we have to put up with it, you know, like the last fast and the furious, all, all seven of them, you know, like, you're like, okay, you know, like we're not critical of those (laughs) things, bad writings. So, you know, like, and I, I think that's why when it comes to this show, I'm, less critical of it but also i recognize the work and effort that a lot of the writing and the casting puts together you know and and i try to grade it on that level of like lowering my expect not lowering my expectations but recognizing that as people who consume media we don't make room for native people to make mistakes we kind of judge them against these other actors and directors who've had years to 
hone their ta- hone their craft, but also have so much money behind them. Like people, like a lot of the big names people love have production companies that they like, yeah, I'm going to film a movie, you know, and I'm going to profit off of it. You know, we don't have that. We're still like, a lot of people are just coming off the res, you know, you know, so I, that's how I, I see the writing and casting. There are points where some of the writing fell a little short for me. Some of the acting fell a little short, but at the end of the day, I liked it. Like I, I, yeah. I at the same time, it was the, the, the nativeness of it. I was just like, you know, fuck it. Like I'm, I'm down with that. I'm I don't know. That was it. my whole rant. No, no, it's not a, it's not a rant because you're, you're touching on something that I try to check myself on is my level of criticism. And I'm going to listen to that podcast, by the way, frames for a second. Um, my criticism comes from really like a mindset of scarcity of just like, this is all we got and this is all we're going to get. So I'm going to judge it as such. And it's just like, I can't do that. This already is greenlit for season two. And because of that, I look at this differently because I'm like, they can do it better and they will do it better. I know it. I mean, yeah, even that idea of scarcity, like it's, it's, a, an, it's not a natural scarcity. It's man-made scarcity of years of colonialism and capitalism, excluding indigenous people from like access to capital and creating movies like this. Like, I totally agree with you. Um, and that like, for me, it's like, I fuck it. I like this. I like this show. I don't care. Me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm with you. Yeah. I like it. Um, I like they address real issues. Another positive, they address real issues in Indian country and some specific stuff to Navajo land. Like they talked about forced sterilizations in the IHS facilities in episode one. Um, when Jackie's character, I can't remember her name in this show. Um, let me look this up real quick. When Sally growing thunder, goes to Emily Porn and Emily Porn is translating in the hospital for her uh, to the white doctor. And he's saying like, I don't think you should, i advising against a home birth. And she was saying like, why is he telling me to not have a home birth? He said, well, cause they want you to come in so that they can sterilize you basically while you're like under anesthesia. And she was like, Oh, okay. And then uh, Emily Porn covers for her and is like, yeah, well, you know, she'll, she'll think about it. And so I thought that was great. I've never seen a show talk about or even mention forced sterilizations. Like they just threw it in there casually because it was at one point, it was like protocol to like sterilize native women when they're going in for routine things because it was like a fucked up policy that was in place that was um, that was happening all the time. And it's like never talked about and it's never advocated for is like, hey, why don't we uncover this? You know, um, it's fucked up. But yeah, it happens. And then another one. Poorly regulated uranium mining on the reservation. I like that they mentioned those and took jabs at uranium mines on there. Um, and then mishandling of murder cases. They discuss like jurisdiction issues and how that like messes up the case and the case continuity and the case efficiency. And we get a lot of kind of like missing murdered indigenous like women, but just in general, like native people, native murders don't get solved. Do you notice any other native issues or you want to comment on these? Um, I, I think that's, I mean, even the role of like Catholicism you know, I, I guess Christianity, you know, with mm. Horn's moment of like trying to keep his identity going and, and his ex, uh, experience, you know, dealing with all of that, um, I, I thought was pretty interesting. Uh, and I mean, there's just like little tidbits. I think what I really appreciated about this, and, the, and this is kind of owed to like the writers, is that when it's non-native writers, one, they don't pick up, they either they either go to two extremes. They write to where they don't capture any issues and we're treated as like stereotypes or two, they go to um, the extreme and just write stereotypes. So there's like, yeah, I mean, they're both ends of this spectrum in a sense that one's characterization and one is just so oblivious that it's not even native. Whereas in this case, like they, or I should take that back. They yeah, like it, it, they play into tropes of like the noble savage, et cetera. Um, or the other hand, it's just like, this is like a weird characterization of native people that has no existence in reality. Whereas I think with native writers, uh, as writers, they're able to not beat you over the head with certain issues. They're able to kind of integrate it into discussions and leave it to the uh, viewer to like pull little informations here and there. And I think you know, when you mentioned the forced sterilization, I didn't even notice that. I don't, I, I don't know. How, I watched it twice and I never picked up on it. Um, but I just assumed that was kind of the underlying tension of it. Like I was like, oh, okay, yeah, she's not going to have the doctor. Or she's not going to have the kid there because um, 
this history. Like, but I didn't know they actually used the, the, that particular instance. And then even like the background of like the uranium, was that uranium or was that oil? Um, I, I mean, both actually. It was both, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because even the oil where uh, the Leaphorn son was killed in an explosion, you know, uh, that was in the background. It had some thing, but it hinted at to, I think, the direction of the story uh, of going on. But also, I, I think the one time they really hit you over the head with it is with the activist characters. Um, and this is something that a lot of writers have when it comes to the stories detailing activists is that they make them like this uh, very extreme version of what they are in a sense that they're they, the way that they write activists is like extremely like language heavy vocabulary heavy in a sense that like <laughs> was it i'm trying to remember what oh yeah it's when they first meet the the white person who took over the um oil uh field and then you know it's um Ho- hosky who's like i think his name is benjamin so in the in the story um yeah 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 he, father so like, right, right right yeah father so he plays that guy and he he's like talking to the white person and he's like we're, we're the Buffalo society. We're against your imperialist, colonial extractive um, <laughs> capitalist yeah. economies that, you know, take from our people. It was like, okay, there's too many catch words in that you need to like either back it up or make it a little bit more subtle. But that was one of the only times where I really felt like they hit you over the head with like activists. Mm-hmm. But again, like I said, I don't think it's just natives. I think it's all a lot of media struggles to write activists. Um, and that could just be to like cultural hegemony of like mocking activists who have very serious and validated um uh demands um and so anyway so like yeah i think for me like you said they did a good job of hitting at these issues without hitting you over the head with them by incorporating in the dialogue by showing rather than telling Mm -hmm. um and and kind of like letting the characters sit with these conversations and you know i think the actors did a really good job of like emphasizing that and i think that comes from just like you know being native you know i feel like you're more likely to know how to act in that scenario because it's in your community you know right. so uh yeah I, I i agree with that i think one last one that was um there was a comment and i apologize to the person that I cannot uh remember their name i should probably look this up while i'm talking but the portrayal in the ceremonies, the portrayal of Navajo people or Native people in general in this show, like it wasn't poverty porn for the seventies, especially. I feel like it would it was real easy to say like, "Oh, this is look at these poor Indians, you know, look at look at this desolate land that they live on." Um, but but that wasn't done, and I really was surprised that like everyone was happy. Um, for the most part, there was like nobody like just in the back, like, oh, it sucks to be living here. It sucks to be uh, on this res. It sucks to be Navajo. You know, it's the white man's keeping us down. Like there was none of that. There was none of that. And I think that's a testament to the production, uh, to the production team. And I think it's a testament to the writers. So somebody named Laura Evans. So shout out to Laura Evans. She had a comment on my Instagram page when I posted about Dark Wind. She said, I was background talent on this series. The difference in how we were treated was amazing. The direction was fantastic. For the first time, my directions were not, quote unquote, look pathetic, hungry, and scared, (laughs) unquote. It was, quote, you're gathering for a ceremony and you're all happy to see each other. These are your friends and relatives. So like big shout out to that, you know. Uh, to Laura Evans because like that's true like to for them to be like hey you're at a ceremony you're at a kill a duck like this is a big thing this is right of passage like be happy you know mm-hmm. and I think just that kind of direction and those notes given to the actors like that's going to set a great precedent because this is like the biggest probably native show like show I would say like mm-hmm. Prey is probably the biggest one this year mm-hmm. but like this is bigger than Res Dogs this is bigger than Rutherford Falls because more people are going to watch this than those two shows Right, right, right. I think that's a good point. I mean, um, yeah, I, I never really picked up on it, but I think that's a common thing that in my own research as a, like an academic is we're always treated as like thinking about uh, resilience or resistance um, and thinking about the, the trauma and uh, poverty and, and harm that colonialism has brought upon us and, and still is. Um, but, you know, forget to, hey, we're also kind of jolly people for the most part. Yeah. Uh, I think some people lean in too much to the, oh, we're the sad, angry natives. You know, <laughs> yeah, I know yeah. some artists who like, I'm not going to name their names, but, you know, I took a photo with them and I'm smiling 
And, uh, you know, and just he, mean mugging. <laughs> yeah, he was mean mugging. And then I'm like, why are you? I, I, I jokingly asked him, why are you like, not, I'm not smiling. He's like, oh, I don't want white people to know I'm angry. You know, I don't want white people. to happy. <laughs> you know, I'm just like, you're so corny, you know, like, stop it. Um, and and, and, and performative as fuck, man. Right, exactly. And it's like this prominent native artist. And I'm just like, Jesus. Anyways. Um, yeah, but like, that's it. Like, yeah, I think I like that. Like, there's despite all of the issues that we know are in the background, we don't have to have that shown in our face. Mm -hmm. We don't need the audience to see that. Um, and you know, there might be other ways of incorporating that kind of actual background, um, or more, uh, yeah, yeah. Like that, that, that's actually a theme maybe in season two, it's going to be tricky, but again, this maybe goes better to like you, you, you see it versus telling it and they'll Mm -hmm. have to figure out creative ways of showing the actual issues, um, that exists on the Navajo nation. Uh, and so, yeah, for me, I thought that was pretty a good a good point made because people we tend to just like it's yeah like it's it's sometimes it just leans too heavily into trauma porn. I think is yeah. the, the poverty trauma porn. porn. Yeah, poverty porn. Yeah, that's the best way to say it. Um, you know, next positive was they put traditional stuff in the show and it's heavier in the books, but they didn't explain anything to the audience, which I like. You know, the Kinal Doc was in there. They gave zero explanation to that. Um, yeah. They just barely hinted, you know, that she had her first period. And it was just like, there was no explanation as to why she's running, why she's grinding the corn. It's just like, this is just life for these people, you Mm -hmm. know? And I appreciated the subtlety in that because if this was non-native people running and writing it, I think it would have been very different. They would have taken the time to like, um, as, as a writer would call it, to put a hat on a hat, to over explain things. And I'm okay with the audience, like not getting some of this cultural stuff because they shouldn't. Cause they're not Navajo, you know? And uh, another instance of this was like uh, Lieutenant Manuelito Bernadette blessing herself after her first encounter with the witch, you know, the, the way she blessed herself is debatable whether or not it's valid or not, but I just like the way that they did it where it's just like, this is, you know, and it was explanatory like, Oh, this is, she's just blessing herself, you know? And then the NAC meetings, I like that uh, at the very beginning, the first episode, like when they went to the TP for the peyote meeting, for the peyote meeting, like they just went in flat closed then time lapse they came out the next day and it show any yeah. singing they didn't show any like you know anybody sweating over a fire profusely or tripping balls <laughs> on peyote like they just said like hey some shit happened you know we had a good we had a good sing now now here's what you do and then that's where he reveals kind of his vision for like the explosion of the oil rig but that was like the only like cultural part that they really shared and that was david mint thunder shout out to david mint thunder oh is that a um, uh, mid the prey actress yes yeah, amber mint thunder okay. yeah amber mint thunder's dad um, but yeah, I mean, I thought that was fucking cool. Like that, the, that kind of subtlety was prevalent throughout the show where it's like cultural stuff, you know, when it gets to the witchcraft, the same thing that was mm-hmm. a little more overt. Yeah. Um, and I think that was on purpose, of course, you know, like the white streak in the hair, um, when you had an encounter with the witchcraft, with the witch, um, you know, you had like the tokens, the layout of the tokens, the layout of the objects that you're trying to use for ceremony. Right. So like some of that stuff I liked and didn't like, but for the most part, I just really enjoyed that they didn't explain this because uh, my negative for the show is like non-native people fucking love this shit to the point where it's like <laughs> they're going to ask uncomfortable questions to native people in general because they think we're a monolith and they're going to yeah. ask like really stupid questions to Navajo people because of what they read in a book on a Tony Hillman book or what they saw on a TV show. But they didn't give really give opportunities for them to have an in because they just kind of left a lot of it ambiguous, which I thought was really cool. What did you think? Yeah. No, I agree. I think, you know, like I said, there's, it's easy to nitpick at certain cultural things, but for overall, I think it it was good. I like the fact that even with that vision scene, they could have gone tropey, like a non-native where it shows like, like his his eyes flickering and the different images of the oil rig blowing up. And then he goes down and he's like, and then he does like some kind of like pan indigenous, Oh brother, don't go the white man's machine. You know, like they did it. Just just like like, rocking back and forth, super sweaty, you know, right over his white. Yep. yep, Yeah. And then like drums in the background or like, Mm -hmm. you know, they didn't do any of that. And I, I appreciated that even with like, um, like you said, you know, even even though the the way she you know tried to offer protection for herself, I was like, oh okay. I, I think it was funny. Like I, I I never knew this was a personal question, but like you know that one question where it's like, do you carry a medicine pouch? You carry a medicine pouch, yeah. You know, and I'm like, I, I'm kind of like open where I feel like I'm like I would I'd ask that kind of question, but I guess it's kind of a personal thing. I don't know, but I I'm just like I would ask someone openly like, where's your medicine pouch, mm-hmm. etc. Um, 
but yeah, I think those little things at least help make it feel real. Um, and I, the other half too, is just like, this is supposed to be in the seventies. So who knows? Yeah. You know, I think if these writers talk to people who live in the seventies about little, um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? This phrase that describes like, uh, very, uh, temper, like time period, accurate mannerisms. Yeah. Um, you know, they can make it real and they can make it come to life. So yeah, I, I, like you said, I think the fact that they didn't explain anything, um, is works well on a cultural level of like keeping things secret, but also at the same time, it's a mystery show. The less, you yeah. know, it might be better. And Absolutely. Some you just don't need to know. Yeah. And I think that going back to your medicine talk question, I think what was cool is I took it as like, that question in general, like you shouldn't tell someone where that is because like someone could gudgeon you or someone could be out to try to gudgeon you, like trying to like do something <laughs> to you. So yeah. if they know where your pouch is, then, you know, they're a better chance to make you susceptible to some shit. So See, um, I, thought I didn't that's, know that. I, I, I thought, I'm over here showing everybody my medicine pouch. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, and then there's like a the medicine pouch. I keep it in my neck, you know, and I, I, I'm, I'm a real deep sleeper too, by the way, just so you know. Right. Yeah. I mean, other people, I mean, like I know Navajos who make that into a nasty joke. Where's your yeah. medicine pouch? I'm like, yo, shut the fuck up. Yeah, Anyways, for real. Yep, yep. Um, but you know, things like that. Yeah. So yeah, like you said, um, and like uh, what I said last time, was just it compliments the mystery of things. Like mm -hmm. I, I don't mind if a native show gatekeeps gate indigeneity, <laughs> like mm -hmm. we should no, gate, gate keep this. I think, um, you know, I talked about how, you know, that they tried to make attempts at having serious conversation on Navajo, even though it was, you know, subpar, in my opinion, like they fucking tried a for effort there, a for fucking effort. There was more Navajo tried to be spoken in this movie than when talkers, which was a movie about fucking Navajo could talkers. So I give this movie kudos for that. You know, I was uh, going to add to one of the most native Navajo esque part of the writing is how rushed the relationship between <laughs> was. I was like, that is the most typical Navajo relationship <laughs> ever. It was season. It was episode three. Oh yeah. My clan. And then episode, episode five, I got nothing here. And she's like, you have me. And it's like, Whoa, yeah. wait a minute. We just, what the hell? Yeah, yeah. You just met like, I think a week ago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, for real. Yeah. I just yeah. met you at a basketball game a week ago. Yeah, I love real. you and you're yeah, not I my love clan. You. What? <laughs> oh god it's insane yeah. yeah that was super that that progressed quickly um you know what i really enjoyed speaking of bernadette was the witchcraft mm -hmm. this is my biggest positive in the show because it was fucking terrifying um in general skinwalkers are terrifying to navajos but this is like that shit was too real for me all the scenes where ada growing thunder like the very first one when she opens the door at her house and kind of like tries to grab Bernadette's hair like that, just that scene, like it just was too real for me. And when she's like praying in the ground and like digging in the ground, burying her hair, I'm just like, Oh God, like, I don't, I don't like it. What's funny though. And it goes into a negative. is like how they portrayed her, like keeping all of their hair and stuff. Um, that's like such a white person's interpretation of how you like, do that <laughs> shit. But overall, that witchcraft was was next level. And I really liked it um, because normally it would be really like stereotypical and just overdone, you know, and yeah. just completely not understanding native culture at all. Like it was really just ominous and it's just a it's just a part of life. Like it's not like anyone's like, oh, that shit's not real. The only person that thinks that is Jim Chi, who's like an FBI agent who is the outsider, even though he is Navajo in the film or in the TV show. Mm -hmm. Like everyone acknowledges it as a reality. And I really like that. Yeah, no, I agree. I think for sure, this is something that I, my experience that of being Navajo is the whole idea of the idea, the whole concept of witchcraft really hinges on like personal space. Mm -hmm. Like that's something, you know, if there's anything like that, you know, cause to be witched, I shouldn't explain, but you know, certain items can be grabbed and be used as a, as a vessel, et cetera. But all of it hinges on like, having your own personal space, making sure people you don't know too well, don't get too close or go through mm -hmm. your stuff, you know? And, and that's something I think this show did really well, especially with that scene of like personal space. I was like, I, when, even when she was like, what's going on? And then it was, I was like, Oh, that's too close back up, you know? And then like yeah. other instances, I was like, you need a, you need, we need some space here. And I, I think that brought out why for me that helps really, um, bring that out is because again no one mentioned personal space it was shown like you mm -hmm. are navajo people you know we don't get too close to people we don't know 
because of that aspect yeah. of it. Like Navajo is for the most part, at least traditional ones. Like we're not big huggers, you know, we're just kind of like, we're not like super like touching your, like, you know, how some people walk up to you and like rub your shoulder. Like, Hey, how are you doing? It's been a long time. <laughs> yeah. It's like, we, we, we don't do that. Yeah. Um, we, 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 we value personal space. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and we value getting to know people and we value like taking the time to know people. Mm-hmm. And I think that's why we get labeled as like quiet a lot. Um, and I like that. They're just kind of like interweaving that in the show. Um, so, and I think the last thing, my last positive and the most important to me is the shit's just entertaining. It's right. AMC plus people like it and already has a season two. We're going to get more. We have more, we have more accurate representation in other shows and other movies, but no one sees it. Right. Like beans, blood quantum, Atra the fast runner. Like those three films are like next level representation but nobody sees those like, like non-natives aren't going to show up to go watch blood quantum or Atronajuat, you know, like, but those, but you watch those and you're just like, this is the pinnacle of like, of like, of horror, of like storytelling, you know, of trauma, of drama, Mm -hmm. but like, this is different. And I think that's, what's so awesome is like people like this and they're going to keep showing up and we get to see great native representation and, an all native writer room, like showcase their talent. So I think that's the biggest positive. No, I agree. I think, you know, for me, um, yeah, it it was entertaining. And I think if it's entertaining to hold my attention, I think that's fine. Cause like, I usually check out when I can (laughs) tell, I'm just like, yeah, this isn't it. Like I can't Mm -hmm. sit through some of this, but if, if for the most part, I'm like, I'm there for, you know what's going to happen in the story if it's intriguing but also just in general like how well am i being you know kept for this and i think you're right i think besides prey and smokes or even smoke signals is kind of like a cult classic if we want to yeah. keep it that yeah but like for real praise like you know people love that shit even non-natives are like this is the best thing ever in the world and then wind river isn't nece- i mean it's not necessarily you know one of those things and pocahontas but those are the Pocahontas is like the worst representation. Yeah, of like yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I think you're right. I think I having a show that has entertainment value, but isn't able to, you know, it doesn't land it perfectly with representation. I I'm willing to do that, and it just means that we can improve upon it, and we'll just have to see with like season two as to like if they learn from like the criticisms or the constructive criticisms of making the show better because yeah, capital, I'm sure it made a profit, you know, we, so it's positive. It's going to go, it's going to try to do it again. And you can either be a part of it or you, you don't be a part of it. And if you're a native writer, you want to like refine the way you have indigenous representation in creative ways so that you do better and you're able to create better or you're, you're able to, hone your craft for future projects okay. that may either be independent or large scale. Cause I mean, I would love to see prey too. And, you know, so if we have writers in this particular project, AMC project, and they go to pray too, and they work it out and they figure it out that that works out for me, you know, things like mm-hmm. that. So let's get to the fun part, Marley. Let's talk about the negatives. Just talk shit about this movie or this oh, TV show. Fuck. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, you go yeah. ahead. You kick it off. I, I don't, I think honestly though, I like, I, I talked like, I think all the negatives I had, I, I sprinkled in between the positives. Okay. Um, I, like I said, the, some, some acting, I'm just like, that could have been redone. Like I know when, when the father finds out about, um, you know, the daughter dying, he just goes, ah, and falls down. I'm like, ah, I don't know about that. <laughs> um, you know, uh, Jeremiah Batsui's performance. I don't know. I'm sure he was probably told to act in a certain way, but at the same time, like he looked way too suspicious, like ease up on the suspicious <laughs> aspect. Cause he was, like had his glasses down and he was like looking at you while his head was pointed down. I'm yeah. like, Look, I can tell you're the bad guy, yeah. but maybe that's why like, are you walking around with a flashlight on your chin? Like you he's easy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah he's, he just looks overly ominous. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> right. And, you know, for me, I'm just like, okay. Like, I mean, like I said, I, as I mentioned before, I've read too many Hillerman. So I knew there's a white person bad guy and a native person bad guy. It's like rush hour. Every movie, you know, there's a bad <laughs> white person and you know there's a bad um, you know, person oh, of color. I and, love, I love, I love that you brought up rush hour 
for this reason. My negative is the native language, the way it's spoken. The <laughs> in Rush Hour Two, when Chris Tucker tries to speak Chinese and Jackie Chan does the translation of what he tried to say, <laughs> like that's how I felt the Navajo was in this movie. Like it was at least by like the non Navajos, it was just like cringe and kind of like really, really just off putting. But um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean. When it comes to the language, I'm like, yeah, like this is why the, the Navajo language is unbroken during World War II, baby. No, I'm just kidding. The Navajo yeah, nationalist yeah. comes out of me. But no, I mean, yeah, like it, it's a tough language. And there are moments where I'm like, huh, I wonder, they, you know, they could have done more. To, I feel like they could have had more time to work it out, to figure it out. Because you can tell even I feel like I want to ask non-natives if they could tell the difference, you know. Yeah, for real. I think I think that would be a great litmus test of like what it what did a native person think in general, you know, just not, not a Navajo. Cause I think Navajo people, we're going to be the most critical. We're going to talk the most shit. Cause we're just toxic as fuck, but also because it's our language. Mm-hmm. Um, I think going back to what you were saying about it being difficult, like the, the, the white YouTuber we're talking about, Shao, Shao Mink, um, Shao Manic, that's how you say it. He actually had did a story on his YouTube channel afterwards he said that out of all the languages he's learned, and he's learned a shitload of them, he said by far Navajo is the absolute hardest. Mm. And he gave like specific, like kind of like, uh, uh, gosh, I don't can't remember what the linguistic word is, but he gave he gave specific like linguistic reasons why like Navajo is the most difficult language for him to learn and why it is so difficult to learn. So that made me feel good for being a dummy and not knowing Navajo and being <laughs> fluent. But also yeah. it like validated like this shit's just hard. And so it's really unfair of me too to like hold that uh, standard like, like to like other native actors because it's still a brand new language. Like just imagine if they hired me and you to like be in a movie and you're like, oh, by the way, you're bilingual and you're speaking French. I know you don't understand. I know you don't speak French. I'm, I'm assuming you don't, Marley. Um, but it's like, okay, you're going to speak, you're going to come off as like fluent French for like at parts in this movie. And we're like, what the fuck? Like, we're, it's going to sound off. It's going to sound bad at times, no matter how much coaching you get, no matter how much time you spend. Like, it's just, it's, you only got months where these people have years. And so um, I just don't like that the, maybe part of the showrunners recognize that uh, at mm-hmm. times where it's like, they recognize it as like a real language that people still speak today that should be respected. Um, as such, because they wouldn't do that with French, non non French speakers are like, oh yeah, you will go ahead and you know, inglorious bastards. They're like, oh yeah, go ahead and uh, speak German for these scenes, even though you don't speak German at all. Just you know, just wing, you know, we'll give you a few months of training, you make it work. It's like no, they yeah. chose like people that are fluent in these languages. Yeah, yeah, I, but, I think that's a good point. I mean, they they I mean, they they recognize the importance of language when it comes to indigenous people, and they they did their best to try to get it down. And I think as indigenous actors, they, you know, who come from their own communities, they also have the experience (laughs) of like language and, you know, how that emerges in everyday life and also like larger discussions about like politics and identity. And I think based on what I've seen, you know, in the timeline that they had, you know, like, it's not going to be perfect, but you know, Navajo is pretty hard. Like, yeah, you know, (laughs) I think, yeah. I think a big negative too is like through the grapevine, I'm never going to name names, but I've heard people who are on set of that show before the show even came out that the Navajos had issue with that setup. Some Navajos anyway, um, were just like the one, like the fluent ones, especially it's just like, bro, I'm sitting right here. Give me those <laughs> fucking lines. I'll knock that shit out of the park, you know, <laughs> while they're sitting there with like, you know, the cast members like, no, no, this is how you say it. You don't say it this way, you know? Like, do you, what's funny, though, is, like, uh, Bernadette Manuelito, the best Navajo line she had, the best Navajo word she had, she said degis, like, perfect. <laughs> she said degis, like, just like a Navajo. Um, but, yeah, I, I, you know, but like I said, it's another language. It's difficult. It's real unrealistic for me to expect them to do a great job. But I think that's more of a knock on the showrunners and not the actors themselves because they did yeah. their best. And... You know, I, I will give another kind of like uh, insider knowledge. I've heard through the grapevine that in the future, they're going to try to dial back some of the potentially dial back some of the language spoken by non-native, by non-Navajos mm-hmm. and increase like the fluent speakers um, just to kind of add more respect to the language. But that's mm-hmm. kind of like TBD. But like even then, like they're they're listening, you know, they're aware of the feedback and they're 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 open to it. They're receptive. So 
the fact that it's even thrown out as like a possibility, I'm just like, hell yeah. That's why this show is like awesome and it's going to be great. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think that's a good direction. <laughs> Maybe that's what we can end it on is like a uh, constructive, uh, I guess, constructive suggestions if any of them are listening of like what we think what we think would be useful to making this a, a better show yeah i think um you know all the side characters are navajo i'm counting that as a positive and negative and i, I agree with you let's add that as constructive criticism like all the dead people all the non-speaking <laughs> roles and all the one-liners basically any of those people were actually navajo so that's kind of like if, if let me know if i'm wrong but that's basically it like and I think that, you know, as a Navajo person, you just recognize, you're like, oh, that's a Navajo person in the background. Um, and I thought that was interesting, but it was kind of like, you clearly don't have any issues hiring Navajo people. You just don't want them speaking in a like yeah. prominent role because you don't know who they are. Um, and I get it. It's AMC plus it's a fucking industry. It's like, you know, you got to make money, but at a certain point, it's just like, give some trust to people, give some latitude, give them some rope. Um, but, you know, like I said, season two, you can enhance that. You can make things better. Uh, my next negative was it was shot on the Tezuki Pueblo Res. But mm -hmm. I think it's not as big of a negative as I initially thought, because I heard your your kind of uh, comments earlier in the show about, like, we gave money to the Tezuki Pueblo Res. Like we, we, we provided a source of income to them for the future because they outfitted their old kind of gambling hall into like a studio and so mm -hmm. i don't look at it as like oh man this shit's like terrible they shot it in la and not on the res i'm just like i'm just comparing it to the old dark wind movie because mm -hmm. that was like straight up like in the tuba city area and it's just like that was more authentic quote unquote but i don't necessarily yeah. think it has to be shot on the res 124 7 i think that's why like dark wind i liked it that they just kind of like, oh, here's some like sandstone kind of landscape. Let's just keep it there. And I'm like, yeah, that could be anywhere in the rest. You know, that's close enough. Right, right, right. Yeah. I, I, I so for me, I, I want to extend on that whole on location thing. I think okay. that's a great idea. Like, have it more on the Navajo Nation. Now, this could just because like Navajos recognize, you know. Yeah, we do. Right. We do for sure. Yeah, and natives too, because then they're like, "Oh, that's clearly on the Navajo Nation." Yeah, um, even even well, let me interject quick. Even though it. it was a like rough sandstone area, kind of where the majority of the film was shot, like where they would go meet uh, Ryan Begay's family. Can't remember his role, his show name in the show. Where they would go see um, Father So's house. Like I know that's just a general kind of like you know sandstony area, but that's not on the res. Yeah, that's not Navajo sandstone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's a reason why we have a, a specific sandstone called Navajo sandstone. Yep, 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 yep. Yeah, no, I mean, and that's like it. Like I was watching, I'm like, yeah, that's not the Navajo Nation, and it took me out of the the show a little bit. So I think more on location scenes. That's why Dark Wind 1991 does so good because it's fucking yeah. to a city. Like you can, I can yep, point yep. it out if, if I was watching it. I can point it out. It feels more ingrained. It's also why PBS just feels very like distant. Um, so on location and. You know, this is something I, I don't actually. Not, I was going to go on this long tangent, but I think like no, the, Tosuki, right yeah. the, Tosu, the Tosuki Pueblo have a really good idea that I think the Navajo Nation should follow is turning our landscape and and really trying to capitalize on the growing film industry. Yeah, the fact like, that we have landscape that people it, want. It, in our last in our last chat, we mentioned the Cherokee have a Cherokee film and television office, like a department in their tribe. Mm -hmm. Like why don't the Navajo have that? Like if they did that shit like five years ago, this would be a perfect opportunity to be capitalizing on that shit. Right. right. Now. They, they could be paying Navajo people to construct mm -hmm. a warehouse. They could be paying Navajo people to learn uh, movie making skills. They could yep. be hiring. Yeah. Um, you'd have people. Navajo preference for hiring for sure. Right. Yeah. And like you, you'd be able to go through different spectrums. It would help the college be able to expand on its, uh, uh, curriculum um, but also mm -hmm. at the same time it doesn't have to do with energy production doesn't necessarily have to do with manufacturing it's literally kind of like i'm not saying it's sustainable but it's just literally just providing a service and having people get paid for that and also just using navajo landscape and then navajo consultants who can consult movies and, and whatnot so yeah i think that's that's it's what, really I, it's I really just another branch of tourism which i really like you know it's kind of just touch and go like see see what you got to see and then get the hell out Right, right, and and it would benefit us, and I'm sure it benefited the Tasuki Nation or t the Tasuki Pueblo Nation. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, and, and my final thing that I wanted to, and you mentioned that this is something you think is going to happen, 
is move away from Tony Hiller's source material. Keep the characters. Yeah. And maybe create new characters. But this is in the 70s. The 70s in the Navajo Nation. I mean, okay, just in the in, in native country, you have like the occupation of Alcatraz in 1969. Mm-hmm. You have the 1970s as the era of self-determination. Like, and then, you know, you have the occupation of Wounded Knee. I mean, and, and the opening of like survival schools that AIM did. And then like on a general level within the Navajo Nation, you have like the Coalition of Navajo Liberation. You have the Navajo Hopi Settlement Act. You know, you have CERT, you know, of like people coming together that could easily, that is of 25 different tribes trying to renegotiate resource contracts. You have like the Navajo Nation's turn in its economic development to tackle unemployment and to try to build a private sector, you know? And then you have AIM taking over Fairchild Plan Shiprock. You have the Church Rock Uranium Spill in 1979. I love it. There's so much history that you could build upon or kind of connected to that would make it feel more Navajo, but also make it feel more grounded and also provide you with enough um, historical sediment to kind of come up with a fresh creative way to write about Navajo people, but also to give like native like people good representation, but also an example of how you can build, you can write and create a very, um, positive navajo or native representation that if you ground it in history you know um <laughs> fucking a navajo historical consultant marley lister over here hell do yeah. it do yeah, it for season me. two fuck yeah hell yeah that's awesome you want, you want to know about the navajo Hopi land settlement act i mean that's dark winds like that's that's dark winds 1991 is based off of that like it's mm-hmm. based on the land dispute you know um and and i mean uranium they like like i said they they hinted at uranium and oil and this is when like the navajo nation is like trying to like build its sector and to use the revenues for you know social services and i mean like indian self-determination and education assistant act of 1975 like come on like there's all these things mm-hmm. and i think you know if the writers are listening which i hope they are just kidding but like I think <laughs> there's a lot of good historical material you could right. kind of just build off um that yeah. doesn't that, that allows you to not make the mistakes that tony hillerman did and I think there's a good opportunity to do that. And I'm positive that they'll be given the latitude to do that um, because they already have to a certain degree. So it will just be to what extent. Um, another negative, I got two more negatives really. Uh, in general, I hate that there's this like rekindles the fascination with Indians, the native, like the Navajo lovers, the culture vultures as you know, um, Marley had coined it in our chats, you know, in <laughs> Instagram. But it like further mystifies, it, it gives people the opportunity to mystify native people. There's going to be a fascination with like Navajo witchcraft again, whether it's like skinwalkers or witches, more non-natives are going to be like all about Navajo shit again. And it's just mm-hmm. like Twilight. It's going to be like a bunch of ignorant questions coming to that res, that the Quillet res. Um, it's going to be like people are going to be flocking to the Navajo res, like asking ignorant ass questions and like that's what I don't like is it this show invites that kind of feedback and it's kind of like audience like fanfare but what it's all coming from a place of love because they just love the show and they love native culture but it's like it's I always ask why Mm -hmm. so ATX Austin Television Festival premiered uh, episodes one and two maybe just episode one I think it was episodes one and two Um, and I watched the Q&A afterwards and out of all of the Q&A questions they got, there was this one older white dude that came up and he asked the question to the panel. It was like, it was the, all the star cast. It was Chris Ayer was sitting up there. Um, the show creator was sitting up there. It was like a bunch of native people like Kiowa Zon was up there, Deanna Allison and Jessica Madden. And he asked the question of like, how do I learn more about the Navajo culture? And I was just sitting there like, oh, God, like we're going to get a bunch of these questions <laughs> of just like, how do I learn more about Navajos? You know, how do I learn more about this? And I'm just like, man, it's coming from a good place. Like they just want to know. But it's like they're really you, it's not just a chapter out of a book that you can take. Like like the Navajo worldview is they always, we always talk about holistic being holism. Like it's always about holism. It's not just a like, how do I learn more about this piece? It's like, bro, you got to just dive the fuck in. You got to move to the res. You got to go live in a Hogan. You got to go like haul some fucking water. You got to live the life. You got to have like generations of people like impacted by like open pit uranium mining and boarding schools and like generational trauma. Like all of that is part of like the Navajo experience and it influences who we are 
and how we talk, how we interact with people, both native and non-native alike, both Navajo and non-Navajo alike. And I think it's really, it's such a like simple question to ask and it has such a like layered answer, but that's what I don't like is those conversations are going to constantly be coming now to Navajo people. I don't know. What do you think about that? No, I, I think uh, that's just what happens when you have like representation, you know, it's, you're going to have some weird ass people who just fetishize it and then come up to you and be like, yo, I want you to come teach me how to do a sweat ceremony. <laughs> yo, chill out. Like, I mean, it mm-hmm. happens, you know, and I agree. Like it sucks. It's like the, the thing I saw on Twitter, someone said it's the, the the when the pendulum swings you know it's got to come back and 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 what was it the other side of it i can't remember what the hell they said but i can't take credit but like some of what you said is just like yeah people will become overly fascinated and they'll start to fetishize and you know take this uh media piece of media and then just run wild with it you know i think my advice to those people is be like robert redford robert redford has been a native ally since forever yeah fuck yeah you know what he, you know what he does he gives us money Give us, I fuck, give yeah, I, give us I, fuck, I fuck with Robert Redford. Robert Redford, he's like a pioneer, man. Before it was popular to give a shit about natives, like that dude gave a shit about natives. Like he was all about native opportunity, propping up native voices. Granted, he greenlit Tony Hillerman because he thought it was about natives, but still, like there's other work that he greenlit. I want to yeah. say Indian Horse, he was a uh, he was a producer on that, you know? And I'm just like, man, he's like he's attached to like all these like other works and i'm just like man he, fuck yeah robert redford he's the he's a real life lieutenant john j dunbar from <laughs> i'm just kidding no uh, but, yeah no i mean but yeah like that i mean it, it's you know you got to feel those kind of questions i mean and you get that even outside of that like I, i'm an i'm a phd student and you'd be surprised how many people come up with me some weird shit that are phd people and i'm like okay this, here we go but you know and i think to combat that is maybe to the more i don't know like i said like if they put it in grounded in history and they like cite events then people might do their research on those events rather than focusing so much on the culture because that's what they're really after they're after the culture and you know Mm -hmm. it's it's always the culture that they're like oh i want to you know i want to remove myself as a position of a descendant of a settler or a settler etc um, and feel more innocent, you know, and, and, you know, and not acknowledge my complicity in settler colonialism. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's always culture. And I think the best way to do that is offering history. It doesn't have to be in your front, in your face, kind of bump, like pounding it into your head, but like reference certain things, like, you know, talk about the Bennett phrase. And then someone might be like, what is that about? Ooh, Look into it, you know? Yeah. Like, little shit like that. Like if you're able to, to counter this fascination with culture, Native people, I find it best to just talk about history. Yeah. And then it's not my place to talk about culture. Yeah. Because, like really because cool that's, somebody. yeah, because history is undeniable, but also it gives people an opportunity to learn about shit that they can look up themselves mm-hmm. instead of like, hey, how do I learn about Navajo culture? It's like, maybe you should start with history and then, then, then tell me you want to learn more about Navajo <laughs> culture. Cause I'm positive that's a, that's a better page turner than our culture. Right. Cause you're just like, man, they kept doing that shit to you and that shit to you. And, you know, like I've mentioned multiple times on my show, like I'm born with a cleft palate because my mom was raised uh, downwind from an open pit uranium mine at rare metals, mm-hmm. just outside of Tuba city. And it's just like, and me and a bunch of other kids, we got like uh, symptoms and like birth defects that are akin to kids at Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but mm-hmm. nobody wants to talk about that shit. You know, nobody's like, how do we learn more about how to help those people? You know, it's yeah. like, uh, you know, ha- does Operation Smile do anything with like Navajo nations or like Native nations where open pit uranium? It's like, no, I want to learn more about skinwalkers. <laughs> <laughs> you got to give us $5 million for each episode if you want to learn about skinwalkers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Let's see. Um, so that's pretty much it for the negatives. Um, you know, I would say the last one is just like, you know, Tony Hillman, like, fuck, fuck that guy, you know, at a certain <laughs> level. So I like, I like your comment of just like distance yourself from that universe, make your own. Um, let's get to the final thoughts and really just kind of like wrap it up, take it home. This is the longest podcast episode by far, but I just, I like the conversation and I just, I love that they show Navajo people living. You know, I want to touch on that again. There's no poverty porn. There's no look at these poor Navajos or none of that. You have competent people in leadership. When you and you have competent Navajo women in leadership in this, I think it's a nice addition to all the great content we have. All the shit where you know pray, 
okay. did such a great job of like trying to change the narrative of like having just hypersexualized like native women in um cinema where it's like you're either like lusted after you mm-hmm. are an object to be desired or you're an object like to be sought after by usually a white man and if you are a main plot line like you fall in love with a white person usually or you yeah. need the you need the help of a man to get you where you're going and they don't have that like bernadette doesn't need that shit at all you know like she's like the captain of her own ship she lives right. by herself she's the fucking police officer in that nation you know arguably one of the most dangerous jobs in the world and in such a like isolated location and she's like doing it all by herself you know but it's just another testament to that and then you have on the other side emily porn who is chief or who's you know wife to the chief and uh of police and she's the same way she's like she calls her own shots she's just like no this person's staying in her house you know she's pregnant i know we don't know anything about her but she needs our help i like that you have these strong native women that represent actual Navajo women in our communities, like in this TV show. What do you think? No, I agree. I think the representation of native Navajo women in this is pretty good uh, to the point that, yeah, everything you said, usually it's just like a native princess that needs to be saved (laughs) or, you know, like some witchcraft, spiritual leader, et cetera. Um, In this case, they do a good job of showing like the vulnerability of it. Like, you know, like you have Emma who's dealing with, you know, trying to, yeah, deal with the, the loss of her son, you know, and you have um, uh, Bernadette, who's like, again, living alone, but also very like on her own, like she could easily be a captain. Right. Of, like, absolutely. Police. And, you know, she takes orders, at least as I interpret, she takes orders from Joe Leap or not because of like a line of uh, authority, but also because she respects him. But, you know, and it, even like the way they interact, like, you know, um, Lee Porn apologizes for overstepping and you know her mm-hmm. book, I get it you know little moments like that that I think are really good um and I was gonna mention something about the yeah like even the mother you know after the mother of the the girl who passes or I, yeah who, who passes you know she she kind of has to step up when the other guy just completely crumbles and kind mm-hmm. of has things together and make sure yeah, things yeah. get done you know, and, and little things like that, like, you know, at least the, I admire because, you know, you can tell it's written from people who have experienced this versus like right. some romantic trope that usually dominates a lot of these things. Yeah. And I, I think my last final thought is I'm really encouraged by the fact that they had their finger on the pulse of Indian country, you know, kind of like through the great grind conversations I've had. It's like they, they hear the negative feedback and it's it's evident, too, in like res dogs. <laughs> uh rutherford falls like they yeah. they they listen like they patrol twitter they patrol you know social media like they they know what indian country is saying and i like that that indian country is small enough that they can like see that feedback like they, they have to be blind to not see the feedback so i'm positive they hear the feedback from navajos what i wish they would like with what i wish they would hear is like usually the loudest navajo is the one that doesn't speak for like everybody unfortunately um so i would say like take that feedback with a grain of salt like yeah i get it but at the end of the day it's another language it's difficult to learn it's one of the more difficult languages to learn and if you have any like seasoned linguists tell you like it's like they'll lay it out like why that is and it's just facts Mm -hmm. and i think that it's a lot to expect you to do that um and i think it doesn't frankly i think this show could have less navajo and it still would be fucking badass like it's okay you don't need to add language to add authenticity you already have it and i think what marley said is great is add more history that's how you add more authenticity is tell the truth of what really has was happening at that time and i think you made a great point in saying that yeah no i i mean now that you elaborated my point for me it it sounded much (laughs) better i i mean yeah i mean that's the trope that native people have to deal with is authentic authenticity being tied to language fluency you yeah know, like you're not authentic if you can't speak and in this case like it's i think the best way to try to work around that is you know have native writers but also kind of think about the more abstract aspect of what you're doing like are you reinforcing the authenticity of indigenous people via language or are you including like the more actual lived experience of Navajo people in the seventies where some people might not speak Navajo. Yeah. Like, and I think, you know, yeah. I think that's and why people, that's why people to me, like in Indian country, like more people, like maybe not more, but I think it's, it's, I think it's why like Thunderheart has better representation than dances with wolves and because it's just like facts, 
you know, it leans more on historical accuracy instead of like trying to make it what, what they think people did back then. And I think that that really speaks more volumes and that stands the test of time. Cause you could say like, and at, at a moment in time, dances with wolves, like this is the most accurate representation we're ever going to get. And then you watch Thunderheart and you're like, all right, that's all right. But then like you 40... watch Avatar and you're like, oh yeah. shit. <laughs> they made but us it... blue, babe. Oh God. <laughs> oh. And then for, 40 years in the future, you know, like that shit still holds up as like, man, that was legit. Cause yeah. fucking Thunderheart was like based off of real events. And then you watch Dances with the Wolves again. You're just like, Jesus Christ, like stands with a fist. Like what the hell's what's, what's up with her hair? You know, it's just <laughs> like, Oh God, you know, there's all kinds of problems there. Um, right. Right. But Avatar, I, same shit. You know, I think that's, you know, anyway, that that's a whole nother episode, but go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, you know, I think to end my point, I think, you know, I, I we even if it's not history, like look at smoke signals. Why do people like it? Like the 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 writers really captured, you know, native indigeneity at that time period, and you know, really it resonates within like native consciousness of like, yeah, that's the show because it captures little intricacies and mannerisms that native people um, do, and even with like res dogs, like that's why res dogs is as is one of my favorite shows of all time but also at the of all the native stuff that came out it's up there like it, to me it edges out prey just a little bit more um but because of the way it captures intricacies and that's where again writing comes in of like show don't tell you know if you're if you're having your character do a long spiel about the navajo land dispute versus like showing and then really strategic placements of like the history but like not in your face you can really go a long way with that to the point mm-hmm. where people remember that um but yeah i mean and, and if this show does so great you know it's like season seven and they're like yo fuck it like you know we need to jump the shark do a tony hiller tony hillerman multiverse bring all the cheese <laughs> back i don't care how you do it just bring them back in an episode all the leap horns and be like yo yo this, this is it this is the tony hillerman multiverse you know, oh like my Spider-Man. god and like yeah you do that you like have, spider-man <laughs> meme where all the cheese are pointing at you each have, other you, you, have, like, you have you have fred ward west duty <laughs> <laughs> and zama clown like standing in a circle all pointing at each other yeah and it's like one of these is not like the other and it's like oh yeah i wonder which <laughs> Yeah, oh but, man yeah i like i said that that was my final joke but like in the like you know after this two-hour episode if you're still listening yeah I, I, wait I in your universe it. you're married to bernadette what the fuck <laughs> oh i just met janet p <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's awesome i think what you said is um you know one 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 last thing but we'll close on this one is smoke signals like i would like for it to be looked at the same way that like lenny bruce has looked at where it's like Without that, we wouldn't be where we are now. But then mm-hmm. at the same time, you go and watch like Lenny Bruce sets and you're just like, this shit is so pedestrian. Like, how is this even funny? You know, you watch it because we've progressed to a level where it's just like that is tame comedy. And that is just like it's so pedestrian compared to what we have now. Mm-hmm. And I feel like we're getting there with like smoke signals. When I go back and watch it, the more time that goes on, I'm just like, ah, those jokes are kind of like campy. They're kind of like, eh, they're not really like landing it like they used to. And that's exciting. And I think we always had like just like comedy shit. Like we never had anything like this where it's like a mystery thriller. Um, it kind of sucks that like it's Tony Hillerman source material, but this opens the door for like somebody else like to write a story uh, like this. So we can get more like I'm, I'm all about like True Detective and fucking like like Silence of the Lambs. And so like I would love like some native shit like that to like happen on Indian country where somebody writes some kind of like noir um, or some kind of like thriller mystery like that. Like, you know, yeah. I hope this opens the door for that. A true detective Navajo show would be great. I love oh true my detective. god! Yeah, for real. I know. That I would... know it's pure cop pop. I know it's pure cop propaganda, but goddamn, <laughs> I love that shit so much. You know, that shit is the best. I think that's the perfect uh, way to end the show. Is just like go watch Dark Winds if you haven't. I hope this isn't the first time you're hearing about it, but um, (laughs) huge recommend for this show. Can't wait for season two. And um, yeah, when season two comes out, I have to bring you back on, Marley, and just just light it up again. Let's do it. Hopefully, hopefully when that happens, I'm like, yeah, I'm in I'm I'm episode three. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I did a real good job as a historical consult- consultant on this one. So They said I could be a Wonder Rock uh, administrator. <laughs> so that's me right there. I'm, I'm filing papers. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> you got time to grow out your hair, man. Go ahead and do yeah. it. My, my one line was, go on, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, yeah. Awesome. All right, everybody. Talk to you later.